rolling, rolling. Golden girls are rolling. You remember that oh. advertisement where they were like rolling to Friday night or Thursday night? I don't, I don't remember when. No. Why golden girls of all things? But it was on all the time. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. weird. Hi, DJ. <laughs> ah, in five, four, three, oh, two. Start. Okay. Hello and welcome back to another excellent episode. I didn't say exciting there because Mitch told me not to say exciting. Uh, this is DSLR Film New Podcast episode number 63. We're really moving forward here. Mitch, man, thank you for joining me from Planet 5D. What are you up to, man? Hey, DJ. Thanks for having me on again yet another week in this exciting episode of the DSLR Film New Podcast. I, that was so funny. I was like, is he going to say it this week? And then he didn't. Oh. What am I doing? Uh, I found out some great news the other oh. day. This is incredible, awesome news for me. Nobody else gives a rat. Um, I don't have any kidney stones. I did a whole year with zero kidney stones, and the x-rays show there's none forming. So hooray for me. So has this been an ongoing thing where uh, you've just developed kidney stones every year? Well, once you have kidney stones, you're obviously much more likely to develop them. So... When I had this large spat of eight or ten kidney stones back a year and a half ago in July, I started July of last year. Um, so yeah, you have to once you have them, you have to start going back to the doctor unless you're just willing to just not know whether you're forming them or not. So anyway, they did an X-ray on Wednesday, and I'm stone free. Well, congratulations, man. That's a uh, that's some scary stuff. Medical issues are always. It is. Uh, so, especially kidney stones. That's, that's extremely painful from what I understand. Extremely painful. And I, I know we've discussed it before. But So my tip is if you don't want to have kidney stones, drink at least 60 ounces of water a day and drink citrus juice as often as possible because that's what they say helps. I fill this jug up four times a day or five times a day. Well, you, you go, DJ. And it's not <laughs> coffee or anything goofy like that right it's no that's just water i've actually got a coffee cup for coffee now before we get going into the news we've got a few things uh, that i've been up to i've got some cameras in the studio you guys may recognize this and we'll actually talk about it in a minute but super tiny i think this is today is the podcast of tiny 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 cameras uh it's other than that a song for that yeah i know uh someone get on that start writing right away <laughs> on that note <laughs> i think it's time for the news So first up on the list here is actually the E1 camera. This is something Mitch and I have been talking about for quite some time. It is a tiny micro four thirds 4K capable GoPro sized camera. I believe I paid 449 for this on the Kickstarter. The maximum price I think was 799 if you didn't get in on one of the early bird specials and I believe that included a lens. Now this thing is still sort of in the prototype phases and uh, before I get your comments on this Mitch I'm just going to go over it a little bit so you guys can kind of get a feel for it. This is sort of not the finish I was expecting. Uh, a little rough around the edges. It is all metal. Uh, feels like it's still sort of a prototype a little bit. The screen itself, uh, when you power this on, is a TN style screen. So as soon as you get off angle viewing, it does go completely dark. Uh, the firmware is still a little bit iffy on this. I have yet to figure out how to change the freaking aperture on this thing. So that's a thing. And then the batteries are... Very wacky indeed. These are skinny, tiny, little custom batteries. It does come with two, but uh, there is yet to be a way to get more of these. They are working on that, but currently I believe they're mostly focusing on fulfilling orders. So Mitch, what do you think? Is this something you'd be interested in? Well, of course I'm interested in it because it's uh, super cheap and it's it's available much faster than some of the other big name cameras, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but buggy is not particularly good. Is the menu system in English or Japanese? It is in English, and uh, <laughs> it's fairly easy to get around as far as finding what's in there, but uh, there's some obvious stuff missing. Uh, ideally, I would like to have an aperture adjustment of some kind. Also, yeah. the uh, quick menu is a little weird, um, and actually I can put a lens on this and turn it on. You guys can maybe see... A little bit of what I'm talking about here. Let me uh, 
put this 17 millimeter F17 on here, which for some reason is locked at F25. So, and I don't know if that's just incorrect indication. Uh, so you've got a little menu up here at the top. The menu uh, takes a little bit to read the card. And then the screen itself, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think you guys can really see anything. It's that's blown perfect. out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if I darken this up, you can see that it sort of just goes weird as soon as you get it at an angle like this. The, uh, yeah, that's not so the best the radio only, there. <laughs> is the only menu up there on the top? Uh, no, so you get a little bit of display here. This is battery information, record count, and format. And then on the back, you have a regular scroll-through menu. And you can change from camera mode to video mode by pressing this top button right here. And it does tell you what mode you're in up here. So for those of you listening, I'll try and describe this as good as I can. The menu system is very clunky. The screen is reminiscent of a GoPro screen from the very first backpacks that they included. So resolution is not great. You can see what you're doing. And I have next to it the Olympus Air so you can see in size wise the actual flange distance to the lens is pretty much identical on these guys so same depth but imagine the olympus air with a box attached to it uh, the outside of this is not nearly as sealed as you would expect this flap is sort of flimsy here that gives you access to the charging port you do have to charge the batteries inside the camera so if you do need to keep oh. batteries charged the only way right now to charge them is via the camera itself it does have an HDMI mini port as well as a uh, standard micro USB port for getting your stuff off of there uh, there is one other IO port I have not looked into that yet, and that's this guy up here. Uh, that may be for programming, I'm not sure. They do have new firmware out for this version 2.0. I'm currently running 1.6. I just got the batteries charged last night, so I'll start experimenting with those. Um, early reports say that uh, focusing can be an issue with this guy. I haven't had any problems focusing in, and I'm just testing this right now. But uh, I know that some of the people that have received their cameras say that they are having a horrible time focusing. Uh, there is no focus peaking in the menu that I've seen yet, but it does have a crop mode that just gives you one-to-one -one pixel count on the back of the screen. So that's kind of the whole slew of information on this guy. Expect a review or at least a video on this probably uh, into the weekend once I've had a chance to take this out and actually shoot with it. Uh, so far, I like it. I like that I paid four forty nine for it, but it's still sort of half baked. And I'm guessing, even though it's out there, it's probably going to be, I want to say, six months or so before they get everything ironed out as far as controls and whatnot go. Have yet to mess with the audio inputs on this too, and that's something I'll be interested to see how that actually works. Uh, I don't believe there's a microphone on the outside of this. There is simply the audio input, which makes sense for something as small as this is. I don't know. What do you think, Mitch? Uh, question. Battery life. Don't know. Uh, have you reported on it yet that you've been watching? Where are you, yes. where are you finding out people are talking about it? Uh, so there's actually a Facebook group for the people that purchased Okay. this uh, camera on Kickstarter. So I joined that to get uh, kind of insider information on what's going on. And everybody that has the camera has kind of been conversing and talking about various problems, issues, and things that they're running into. Uh, it's a kind of a conversation that's ongoing with the manufacturer as well. So we are all working together to try and make this a little bit better. Well, that's, um, that's, a, that's a nice way of doing it, though. If, if the manufacturer is in there, do they limit? I mean, could I join even though I don't have a camera? I think you can. Uh, let me find a link to that, and I'll put it in the show notes if any of you are interested in finding out more about this camera. Uh, they do. They did send the links out to the Kickstarter backers specifically, right. and the user group is called Z Camera E1 User Group. It is a closed group, so you do have to submit a request to get into that, but... I will put the link here. Well, that's a, I, I think that's a great way of doing it for somebody that's brand new in the camera business like these guys are. At least we assume they are, right? Yeah. Um, to, to be able to get interaction directly from the community and have people work together, I think that's an awesome way of doing it. Yeah, and no one's been really negative in the uh, group. Everybody's kind of had some good input, warnings about things they've run into, 
uh, issues, concerns, and then lots of pictures and uh, video test footage. Some of the video test footage come, has come back very out of focus, and I'm not oh. sure if that's a user error or what's going on. My two small tests I've done so far, it seemed fairly easy to focus this thing, so I don't know that mine has any sort of focus plane issues, but one of the concerns in their Kickstarter um, list of things that might go wrong was uh, making sure that the focus plane and lens were flush with each other. Yeah. And if that's not the case, then you'll end up with, you know, different angles on the sensor that are in focus and out of focus. So I'll yeah. be messing around with that, testing that some more. It's kind of weird. I like it. I like it more than I like the Olympus Air. And actually, let's talk about the Olympus Air now that we've kind of okay. covered the E1. Uh, there's not a whole lot to say until I get the full review on the E1, but um, I'm going to start digging into this. I'm pretty excited to play around with it. Whenever you get a new camera, you just want to, like, take it out and shoot as much as you can. Now, yep. the Olympus Air, this little guy right here, is sort of the competition for something like this. I know you have GoPros and things like that, but they don't have the option to change out lenses. Now, the Olympus Air is the same sort of style of unit. It is a micro four-thirds 16 megapixel sensor uh, spaced out onto an interchangeable lens body, and it's just the body alone with camera controls. Now, where the E1 kind of beats this out is even though the screen is not that great, it does have an interactive screen. With this one, you're shooting blind. Now, Mitch, you've got a post up on Planet 5D about the Olympus Air. What do you think of this guy? Well, this... If, if you haven't seen it, by the way, why are you pointing at me like that? I'm smiling because um, I'm not sure if I read whether you wrote the article or not. Oh, well, no, it was it was um, uh, Hugh. My brain went dead there for a second. Uh, but the interesting thing, I mean, you, you're holding it up, obviously, for the video people who are watching. And those of you who are watching on audio, if you haven't seen it, I mean, it just looks like a lens, basically. I mean, it's round and it has a sensor in it, and you put a lens on it, so it looks like an extension tube, kind of. And then you have the ability to attach a smartphone to the back. So there's a little pull-out, um, I don't know, what do you call it, an adapter? A, a tray, actually, that's adjustable. Tray. And so here it can, is right here. You can tray show up there, so you attach that to the back, and you can put your smartphone on there, and your smartphone connects to it via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So it's communicating to the sensor and your, therefore your lens through your smartphone. So uh, the report that DJ, uh, the DJ <sighs> pardon me, that Hugh did for Planet 5D, he was at uh, Photo Plus last week in New York City, and he sat down and briefly talked to the Olympus rep about the uh, uh, the air and the EM5 XYZ whatever camera that was. <laughs> and I, love, I don't know if you've watched it, but but he was interrupts the guy and he says, "Would you talk to your marketing folks and say that they need to come up with shorter names because saying Olympus OMD E1 XYZ is just too difficult because nobody can remember." Oh, by the way, that's the Mark II. Uh, it's just too complicated, right? And that's one of the reasons why I love that little new camera that you have, the E1, right? It's simple. Easy e to remember, simple name, yeah. E1. I can never remember who manufactures it, but I know it's called the E1, right? So anyway, so there wasn't a whole lot of information in Hugh's story. It was just sort of a fluff piece, okay? I confess, it's a fluff piece. Um, again, I still like the concepts. I'm really interested to see how well it works for you in terms of real-time live usage for filming. Uh, I tend to think most of the people that have gotten excited about it are stills people, so I don't know. We'll see. What do you think? There's some fun stuff with the Olympus Air. Uh, Video-wise, you are locked down pretty tightly uh, you're allowed to shoot at 1080p at 30 frames per second or 2997 uh, basically ntsc format it's not horrible the video quality is actually very decent for this guy the sensor is the same sensor that you'd see in the om1 
D whatever, you know, I'm going to fail at this as well. But the, the thing that's frustrating is actually trying to use your cell phone to control this thing. Uh, if you're in even a remotely heavy Wi-Fi environment, uh, there's lag. Uh, sometimes it'll just drop out. You'll try to transfer photos from it, and you'll have issues there. It's not the most intuitive menu system either. You get three selections when you open up the phone app, and that's one of them is to shoot, one of them is for settings, and the other one is to transfer photos. And I've had it glitch out on me multiple times. As far as shooting blind with this, it's kind of fun because you can walk around, and there is a button right here at the top. You right. press that button, you can autofocus, you'll hear it beep, and then you can press it a little bit deeper, depressed, and it will actually take photos. So if you walk around and just snap off photos all day, you can kind of do some really fun stuff that way. For video, you know, I would say the video quality is way better than what you get out of a GoPro, but at the same time, the controls are just as frustrating as trying to remotely control a GoPro from your phone, if not more so because Olympus isn't very good about updating their app where the E1 actually kind of beats this out. A, you've got 4K video, you've got uh, UHD at 24 frames and 30 frames per second. You've got audio inputs, and you have a lot more control over your settings directly from the camera simply because you have an interface. I would have liked to have seen the Olympus Air with a little bit more access to controls on this thing. Maybe two more buttons, three more buttons, that would give you maybe a light indicator of some kind or a, an LED that turns from red to blue that tells you that you know, you're know you in video mode or you're in stills mode. And then I think it would have been a little bit more enjoyable experience. I do like the idea of cell phone tethering for these types of smartphone slash camera devices, but you know, it only goes so far when you're dealing with that lag. And I think that's probably the biggest issue is control over these cameras. And Getting into the Olympus Air, I mean, you do realize that they're giving us tech from their high-end cameras, and they're trying to cripple it on purpose, and that's why you don't have all those features. If they made this as good as an OMD one Mark whatever, uh, this would <laughs> over you know overpower the sales for those cameras. And this is three hundred bucks, two fifty, I think. You can find it on eBay. It's it's very affordable. So for those of you looking for something to throw in your bag as a backup to your GH4 or what have you for stills or for some video shooting, it's really reasonably priced. So I've forgotten, does it record in camera? I mean, it, there is, is there a place to put a card in there? Yeah, the convoluted setup for this, and those of you listening, you might want to watch the video on this, you actually have to release this thing right here. Then there is yet another layer in this uh, nested doll. <laughs> <laughs> you open this up. Now I've taken off two sections. And then back here, right there in the far section, if you can get your fingernail deep enough in, is the it's a micro, micro SD, SD card. Yeah. So it is weird. It's hard to get to, but it does record what it, it digests. So that part is good. Micro SD is sort of inconvenient as well. Um, you know, your, yeah. most laptops have SD cards, so you have to carry around either an adapter or a card reader in order to get your stuff right. off of this thing. Uh, and you can't tether via the USB, micro USB port here to download footage, or at least I haven't been able to. Uh, so that's what? a minus as well. Yeah, it would. you can charge via this port, but I've plugged it into a couple of laptops, and none of them have recognized this and been able to huh. get the pictures off directly. So... I don't know if that's a me issue or if that's a design issue. Uh, I don't want to say for sure because I've only tried it twice, but uh, it's definitely something that's kind of weird. They do, on the other hand, have adapters for this, and because this has sort of a metal release pin here, uh, Olympus has given out the layout for this to manufacturers, and people have designed little gun holsters for this as well as a full camera body holster with buttons and so on that are Bluetooth compatible with this guy. So there are some cool things going on with it. It's just, I don't think it's for everybody. Um, yeah. Check out the uh, link in the show notes. I wrote just a little brief blog post on this guy, and 
I like it. I'm not going to get rid of it, but I don't know if it's going to fit the exact purpose I purchased it for, which was sort of a GoPro replacement with interchangeable lenses. I think that's where the E1 is going to take over. So does it? Does the air give you some stealth capabilities, or like behind the, you know, maybe a B cam kind of thing to just stick it to a wall or something? I mean, I guess can you can you shoot video without having the iPhone or the cell phone attached? I mean, you, you talked about shooting stills. You can. Uh, you can set this up for video mode, and then the button on the top is a start stop you have no idea what's in focus or out of focus so if, if you're shooting in broad daylight maybe you can just you know stop it all the way down and hope <laughs> for the best but uh, <laughs> any other situation probably not as far as stealthiness goes if you don't have your phone attached and you're shooting stills I mean this is a very inconspicuous little uh, canister so you know, if I saw this in person and I didn't know what it was, I wouldn't realize that it was even a camera. It looks like something maybe, oh, yeah, you've got your coffee in there. You're you know, <laughs> drinking alcohol out of it. Uh, it's right. it's very small. And, you know, palm of your hand, you know, you could do something like this. So I suppose, you know, no one's going to notice me taking pictures <laughs> right here yeah. like so. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. And I, I have been reading articles, and I, and I certainly do not advocate baiting privacy or anything like that but uh you know you and i've talked about stealthiness and and how some people have gotten overtly wacky about photographers and how we are losing some of our privileges out in public so i mean it, it might be an interesting thing for doing street photography and stuff like that but again you have to you have to be on the up and up and we're not doing not advocating any kind of inappropriate photography or video here. But anyway. Now, I've got two cameras in my hand. This is the GH4, and this is the LX100. I can go into an event with the LX100, which is a Micro Four Thirds camera with a 24 to 70 fixed lens, and I can't go into an event with the GH4 with a 24 to 70 equivalent lens. Yet, Micro Four Thirds, pretty much the same uh, low light performance, everything else. This is okay. This is not okay. <laughs> Tell me why exactly that is. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah. Sense. And and you're talking about concert photography or you know stuff like that, right? I mean Yeah, and uh, the Olympus Air is the same way. I mean, 60 megapixel sensors, same as their big boy cameras. You can go out and take as many pictures as you'd like at any event and no one will stop you care or even be concerned. But as soon as you put a hand grip on this Bam, it is dangerous. We can't have it. And street <laughs> photography is the same way, actually. Right. Having something um, con inconspicuous like this means you can kind of walk around and take pictures of whoever you want and no one cares. But as soon as you have a big DSLR with a flash and you're taking pictures of people on the street, uh, they get frustrated, upset, flustered, and they don't even know their own rights as far as photography goes on the street or right. even filmmaking, you know, in public. It, no one really knows what their rights are. They just have these vague notions based on what they've seen on TV or heard about. Uh, they, some people have approached me and asked to be paid. You know, you're not getting paid for this. I'm out here taking pictures. You happen to be in one of those pictures. If you don't want me to use it, that's fine. I, I'll put it aside. But <laughs> I'm not giving you 20 bucks for your freaking likeness yeah. go away right. right yep been there done that been i've uh, been uh, uh had the police called on me not fun all right moving on to another tiny camera here i'm gonna share the screen for you guys uh this is the black magic micro studio they're finally starting to ship looks like it's only the 1080p variant it is capable of shooting raw photo or raw video inside of that tiny little package via I believe they're using uh, DNG for that uh, the 4k version is not shipping yet 900 bucks for this guy same form factor size as the E1 and the Olympus Air a little bit more big boy features like the E1 but uh, no screen so you're gonna have to use the HDMI out for that this is announced at the beginning of this year and it's finally hitting the market the reason I added it to the show notes is simply because the E1 made it to production in half the uh, announcement and production in half the time it took the Blackmagic camera to do the same. So 
Do you think a smaller company is a little more agile than a big company? Time out now. If I remember correctly, the Blackmagic Micro Cinema Camera was announced at NAB, wasn't it? It was, and wasn't this announced after NAB last this year? Technically, well, technically, yes, it was. However, I did see those guys. Uh, if you if you remember, they were in a booth at NAB, which was the first time I saw that camera, and they said they were going to be doing. Anyway, we're talking semantics here, right? So we're talking about the... Mitch just blew my premise out of the water. I was going for the <laughs> small companies being Sorry. agile, but now Sorry. I'm going to backtrack Sorry. on that. We have to, we have to, I have to be accurate now. So, so I, I, but I agree uh, that we have seen slowness in stuff that's been delivered by Blackmagic. We have seen problems, although you are seeing problems with the E1. Right as well, definitely. Um, so it's yet to be seen whether or not the Blackmagic Micro Cinema camera will have software problems or hardware problems, like we have seen in the past from Blackmagic. Uh, so it's it's good. I will say that this seems to be one of the fastest deliveries to me for Blackmagic. Let's see, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November. Okay, never mind. I take that back. It's still <laughs> a long time that it took them to get a camera out uh, after it being announced. It does look like a pretty nice camera, though. I'm looking at the uh, images right here on B&H. You know, it, I'm a little concerned with this vent port system that they have to use in order to cool the camera. Uh, as far as studio use, you're probably okay. Full-size SD card slot, you know, the battery implementation looks very nice. And then on top of that, it's got the uh, weird controller port. This battery. extra. Yeah, the battery you'll notice you can actually just throw like a Canon L LPE6 six. on the back of this guy. Right. Yeah, yeah, which, which is, is rather interesting. Yeah, it? that's very nice compared to a custom battery like the E1 that I'm holding up right here. I mean, you can't even buy these yet. So that is very frustrating. Uh, I think standardization on particular batteries is awesome. Um, I, I did note while I was reading the specs again this morning that uh, they say on the B&H site that it, the, the LPE6 powers for 1.5 hours on okay. the Black Magic, which to me seems incredibly low. I mean, I can shoot all day long with the LPE6 on my 5D Mark III video well, all day. All day on a single well, LPE6? I mean, you got to realize that I'm not shooting constantly. I shoot a lot more periodically than most people would probably do in a studio environment, but I think I can get more than one and a half hours out of the day I'm thinking of shooting video. I've got my 5D Mark III laying around here somewhere, and uh, I was actually just shooting with that uh, yesterday. And I think I want to say about two hours with the battery grip included uh, for video mode, uh, continuous shooting throughout that time. Now, I don't shut the camera on it or shut it off every time I walk away from the camera, so the screen is going continuously, uh, but that's. Maybe my generic batteries aren't as good as they used to be. That's but when that's you, kind of part of the course. Grip, you've got two batteries in there. You're using a, a grip with two batteries. Yes, I am. Wow. So, okay, maybe I'm a freakazoid because I swear it lasts longer than that. But well, now shooting stills, I can go you well, know, yeah. half a day, no problem, half and day, even day. leave the camera uh, on the whole time. You know, it doesn't use up a lot of power. But video mode, especially if I'm continually shooting. It seems like I go through batteries rather fast. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I also, uh, I will say that I don't use uh, Canon batteries. I use generic batteries. So if you want to get into that, like, this may burn your camera down and start your house on fire and kill your children, uh, <laughs> the battery warnings that Canon is continually known for putting out, uh, uh, maybe that's my fault. But I haven't seen that much. As, uh, you know, An hour and a half does actually sound reasonable to me for a camera like this. Uh, maybe I'm incorrect. Uh, well, uh, I stand uh, in in bow to you because you shoot a hell of a lot more video than I do. So. We're going to have to actually 
maybe we should do some experiments on this, Mitch, and come back with an actual report on how long these things last. I anecdotally think two hours, but maybe it was three or four. I don't actually start a stopwatch whenever I put batteries in these cameras. Wow. Now, okay. moving on down the line to, this, this is actually fun, the sensor tech. Mitch, I got this from Planet 5D. I'll let you start off on this one. The Envisage sensor technology that's using like a, a what is it, a black film of some kind? It's it's really rather interesting, and, and I thank you for uh, linking to Planet 5D because we rock over at Planet 5D. <sighs> Modest, too. Um, it's And I think you really need to watch several of the videos, and, and as you pointed out in the show notes, the video quality isn't quite there yet, but what you have to realize is that they're starting out with some early technology. They're really uh, touting the fact that um, it has some, some capabilities that you don't necessarily get in existing technology because they're, they're saying they're getting uh, enhanced dynamic range and uh, basically having a global shutter so there's no rolling shutter. In the demo video, the guy shows that it is a black kind of thing, but I don't know that we necessarily care. Uh, the, and it's and then they say it's black because, quote unquote, it's absorbing more light. So the the whole point of this technology is to get more photons into every virtual pixel on a sensor than a typical sensor currently has today. Uh, I'm no scientific geek. I'm just spouting off what I saw in the video. But one of the things that you note in watching the video that they're demonstrating is it's not as sharp as a typical camera might produce today, but they're still developing the technology. And the other two things that are the other thing that I really liked about what they have done for all those of us who are trying to report and learn about these newer technologies is the fact that they included not only a demo of the product, I mean, they created a little short with a couple of kids, and, and I thought that was, it's, it's a little cheesy, but, you know, it's... It's, it's it, unique, it, though. At least they're showing they're their tech off. Covered. Right. And they're showing a behind-the-scenes which gives you a lot more information. I can't tell you how many times I have say, seen a press release from a company that's just just really excited. I mean, they send me, man, Mitch, we really love you to cover this. And I don't understand it because it's, it's they, they totally grasp everything because they know all the insides and outsides of the technology. But reading a boring old press release, you're like, oh, I don't get it. Why is this exciting? <laughs> Help me understand why this is exciting. And so for somebody to show this off, because if you, and if you look at the Planet 5D article, we actually have two reports. The second report is about another technology. Um, and I simply sort of copied and pasted because I didn't understand it. It was from, uh, I think, F-stoppers um, reporting on a new sensor technology that claims to have enhanced dynamic range, but because they didn't have a demo video and they didn't have any samples or anything else, it's kind of like, okay, so, and so that's why I was really thrilled to see this, because it helps you understand where they are in the technology, and the fact, and I was afraid that some people would say, well, it's a little on the blurry side. Well, okay, they're just, I mean, these are prototypes, right? This is, this is stuff that they're demonstrating new technology, and, and they did even do side-by-side -side with the CMOS sensor. They recorded the same scene side-by-side -side with a regular yeah. sensor, and you, and you could then see the difference in the dynamic range, which was a perfect demonstration. So I, I applaud them a lot for that. Um, whether or not this will be the revolution that they claim it will be, we'll have to see, but. Well, taking a look at the uh, tech itself here, let's take a look at the sensor layout. And I'm guessing here because I don't know 100% of what's going on behind this technology. But to me, it appears as though 
they are using this black quantum film as an intermediate for light coming into the sensor itself. So the light actually hits the photo sites on the front, which is basically just a color filter, uh, breaks loose whatever colors are in the quantum film, and then hits the electron sites at the bottom of the unit. And so with the quantum film, uh, it's darker as a property of the way it's made so it absorbs more light that's coming at it and gives you a little bit more dynamic range and I think that's basically what they were trying to say in their science report they have this cute little thing where uh, children go and ask each of the scientists like what do you do on this portion and what do you do on right. this portion and uh, that's kind of what I gathered out of uh, that report it, it's weird that they did it that way but it's also kind of interesting because it's like okay we're gonna explain this to you like you're a a six-year-old and you wouldn't really understand this otherwise uh, <laughs> the other cool thing is when they do the demonstration and the behind the scenes you actually see that it's it's literally a PCB with the sensor on it strapped to like a board with a computer next to it because they literally have their prototype uh, attached to this like rig out in the environment you know no enclosure or anything like that and they're filming with it so Normally, you don't get that sort of perspective on a new technology, new sensors, so on. Or you end up with something like, uh, remember that uh, hipster camera? What was it? Uh, the it had a, like a C mount, and it was shaped like a Bullock's, uh, the digital Bullock's. Remember the very first videos of that? They showed you a beautiful camera, and then they showed you some video, and then it turns out that that video wasn't shot on this beautiful camera. It was a sensor strapped to a board that they shot everything on, and you had no idea until later press releases. Uh, at least with this, we know kind of what's going on. Hopefully, this will be something we see in cell phones. Uh, the other cool thing, there are rumors that Samsung is going to release a phone with a half-inch uh, sensor in it coming out shortly. And Panasonic already has, I don't know if you've seen that, Mitch, the crazy zoom uh, camera slash 4K shooting phone that's available. I think it's the P1 for $1,000. No. No, I haven't seen that. Uh, it's a... Uh, there's some weird stuff on the horizon, and if new sensor tech brings that forward, I'm excited yeah. for it. Well, there there is a lot of a lot of cool stuff going on. Um, I was trying to look up. I cannot remember the exact pronunciation because there's a group of guys around the world doing the Apertus. I think it's Apertus or something. They're building a camera, uh, and with sensor technology, uh, it's going to drive me crazy now because I don't remember exactly what it's called. Uh, and, but they're doing it open source. They're, they're collaborating with a bunch of just people out there in the public, uh, trying to build a camera, which is a totally different way of doing it than like building a company. And I have, we've, we've talked about it a couple of times on Planet 5D and I just can't remember what the heck it's called. I've got it right here, Mitch. I'll yeah. share the screen. This is Work the... Good. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's A-P-E-R-T-U-S. Apertus. I said it right. I, that's what I said. Apertus. Apertus. So I'm going to go with that. And it looks like this is a sectionalized camera. Uh, sensor appears to be interchangeable. Uh, various slots in the back. Uh, right. All kinds of information on this. Yeah, this does look in quite interesting. Uh, almost uh, looks like a computer of some kind built in to... A camera so that you have. They've sort been of working on this for a couple of years, and 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 if you subscribe to their email, you'll get an update probably monthly, which is fascinating because they're, it's it's not like it's being developed in you know some hole somewhere. You can actually watch them as they're going through this process, and I, as I said, everything is open source, so they're getting contributions from all over the planet in terms of developing this camera. Uh, and so it's it's just fascinating to see how this thing develops as it goes and whether or not it turns into anything. Like, I mean, it's just another example of things that are happening out there in the camera tech world that just blow me away. And we tend to end up talking about the three main brands or four or five or whatever, but there's a lot of still cool stuff going on out there. Now, moving on, we got a few more things to kind of what? shove in here before we get too really? far off topic. Um, I wanted to talk a really quick about DJI investing in Hasselblad. That's a really strange what? and odd combination there. Uh, got a link here to Engadget. What do you think, Mitch? What's going on with DJI? 
I don't know. This is this is really fascinating, kind of questionable stuff. I was talking to um, Eric from Photography Bay, Bay yesterday, and I hadn't even heard about this. So he alerted me to this, and we were talking for quite a while about trying to figure out what what's going on here because it, to me, it's it's I, I sort of I made an analogy of. Volkswagen, and this probably isn't the best analogy on the planet, but you've got DJI, which is doing some some great stuff with drones, and, and they've got like 40 to 50% of the, the sales in the market. Uh, they've got huge uh, valuation in terms of the market. They're worth more than uh, um, GoPro and all that kind of stuff. But here they so so imagine Volkswagen, which everybody pictures as this Beetle, right? This old Beetle car, at least I do in my head. And Jaguar, fancy, expensive camera, in House of Blood, working together on something. I mean, yeah, I just don't picture Volkswagen and Jaguar working together, and and that's how I feel like DJI and and House of Blood working together. The the supposition is that. Hasselblad's always had trouble with money. And here you got a cash flush company, DJI, is making a boatload of money selling drones, and they're looking to have maybe some great lens technology or maybe some better sensor technology that maybe Hasselblad has, and maybe they're going to sort of upscale their technology by by using what Hasselblad has. But but they, they've not only invested in Hasselblad, but they've now got a, a seat on the board. So this is not a, an insignificant little move on their part. Uh, it's, now, it, I don't know. I'm still confused. I wonder if this is more of a, a branding move. You know, like Panasonic ha- likes to put Leica on a lot of their lenses, and, and Sony has a similar approach. Uh, maybe they want to, you know, they've already started moving into the Micro Four Thirds market. Imagine right. for a moment, if you will, like a, a Hasselblad uh, labeled or, you know, similar to like Zeiss slapping their name on everything. Hasselblad lenses. Look look at this lens. This is, uh, it's got Hasselblad technology in it. And then now people will pay a premium for the lens that would have otherwise just been DJI. They, exactly. they right. make lenses? What? Right. Right. The picture, though, uh, from the Engadget article is, is pretty hilarious. It's showing a medium format camera attached to a, a drone uh, <laughs> trying to film a car driving around. And it's, it is really weird. I'm not really sure, as far as patents go, what, what Hasblad has in their stock or portfolio that would be useful to DJI. So it, it'll be weird to see what comes of an investment like this. Uh, I don't really know exactly, <laughs> man, if, if, if anybody's got some insider knowledge on why this would happen, I would love to hear information on this because these two, it, it's like, uh, it's like mixing, you know, steak with, uh, French fries. It's just not, not the same thing, you know? Right. Well, one of the other things that Eric said to me yesterday when we were talking, which I thought was interesting was that. It appears that Zeiss and Sony are kind of really heavily in bed with each other, right? Because Sony's producing a lot of cameras with Zeiss lenses, right? Yeah. And maybe there's there's a lockup in terms of exclusivity there for some of the Zeiss stuff. And so maybe DJI, like you just said, wants to have an upper class kind of relationship for on the lens side of the market to, to bring their their branding up. I mean, he, he pretty much sort of echoed what you were saying, but he, he pointed out that he thought there was some sort of significant relationship with Zeiss, and therefore they maybe DJI wanted to go with Zeiss, but they couldn't, so they picked Hasselblad. I don't know. Well, there, there is another angle on this, too. Uh, there aren't a ton of lens and optics specialists and manufacturers in the right. patent portfolio for optics in general. is It's a pretty narrow market, so... If they want to make lenses and they want branding, of course, is one thing, but also just the simple, the need to have the technology to make glass like that, because 
you don't just go out and buy a machine that carves glass and you know puts micro coatings and so on. That's a very complicated process. Uh, by working with them, maybe they can create an entire line of lenses that have something a little bit special for DJI drones, for their Micro Four Thirds offerings, maybe even a full frame or a crop sensor like 1.6 crop camera for their drones. Because imagine the sensor tech you can buy from anybody. Panasonic makes sensors, Sony makes great sensors. And really, if you think about Hasselblad as an offering, they're really using Sony technology behind the lens in order to get a lot of their uh, cameras out there. I, I want to say mostly Sony sensors and Hasselblad cameras, but I might be incorrect on that. So, you know, pull my card if that's not right. But, <laughs> but I think they are basically taking care of the lens and the body and so on, and then they are buying their sensor tech off the shelf. So in that case, you know, there's no reason DJI couldn't just go buy sensor tech from one of these companies and then work with them to slap a lens on it. And bam, now you have a premium product. And right. this has kind of happened in the past. We've had uh, Russian lens manufacturers being bought out by Chinese companies to give us stuff like Rokinon and uh, uh, Samyung and the various other brands that Rokinon and Samyung could go underneath. So cool, interesting, weird. Uh, I don't know what's going to come of this. Yeah. I will keep an eye out for it. Last okay. thing on the list here, Mitch. Let's see, yeah. is 4K in Canon cameras. You want to talk a little bit about this disappointing yet completely Canon thing? <laughs> well, I found this in Canon Rumors uh, a couple of days ago. Oh, it is working. I was just looking at my sound effects. So Canon Rumors reported in a tiny little note where they were talking about the 1DX upgrades and, and the note simply says that, let me read it for verbatim here, there will not be a, quote, prosumer, quote, unquote, uh, 4K DSLR from Canon in the next round of updates. The 1DX Mark II will get the 4K video, but that's beyond the prosumer market. So that was a tiny little note that I, I saw in there, and I went, huh? Now, we've all supposed over time that the next round of the 5D Mark III, 5D Mark III. Mark IV. IV sorry. Uh, would probably have 4K in it to keep up with the likes of the uh, GH4, GH5, GH6, whatever, you know, coming out there. The Sonys all have 4K. Uh, so this could be a major disappointment, and I can hear lots of people rumbling in... The market going if Canada doesn't put 4k in the next 5d we're jumping ship and and so Canon rumors is saying specifically that's what they believe is going to happen so I can hear a lot of complaining coming in the next update whenever that's going to be now they also said by the way that the 1dx is going to be due April of next year uh, which I was sort of expecting that the three-year time frame for the 5D, what came, the 5D Mark III came out in April, if I remember correctly, of 2012, 2013. And so three years would be 2016, so we're due, theoretically. Yeah. Uh, but Canon Rumors is saying we're not going to get a 5D Mark IV in spring of next year after three years. So anyway, uh, I don't know, DJ, is, is, does this make sense that Canon's protecting their butts by not putting 4K in the lower end? So if they don't put 4K in the 5D Mark IV, which 4 and 4K would be perfect marketing <laughs> strategy, uh, it's hard to see what Canon will actually offer that will make the 5D Mark IV attractive because right now you have the 5D and you have the the 5DS which is your high sensitivity and that's got you know the megapixel count so right. we're not going to see a giant megapixel jump in order to make the distinction between the current line and the next camera we don't have anything else that you would add to that that would not basically denigrate the the higher end 1D series so you can't add like maximum frame rate to you know 
a burst mode at 10 frames per second, that would that would eat up the market for the higher end camera. So then what do you add? Well, you either add 4K or you do something very impressive with either an accessory or something else or, or maybe I guess go down in res or in resolution and create an ultra sensitive low light camera. But I don't see Canon being innovative in either one of those manners. So how would you distinguish the 5D Mark III to the Mark IV? Is this going to be like the 7D and the 7D Mark II where, oh, we changed the sensor a little bit, we increased the burst mode by just a touch, and basically you have the same camera for 2014, and they're doing the Rebel line of adjustments where it's very iterative and there's almost right. nothing changing other than button placement and build quality. It's scary as hell to answer your question. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I love my 5D. I don't, still don't feel like I need 4K for what I do. And again, I typically am just standing in front of a camera doing product reports and stuff like that. Uh, do I need 4K for that? I don't know. But there's going to be a huge hole in the market on the Canon side if they don't do that. Now, maybe... Uh, again, and I feel like I'm promoting Eric over Photography Bay, but we, he and I talked for two and a half hours yesterday. It was a great conversation. We talked about a lot of stuff. Uh, he's really excited about the new EOS M10, I think it was, the mirrorless. He said they've really done a good job. He was looking at the, the M10 at um, Photo Plus last week. Okay. Me? Is there... Is there a possibility that Canon's just going to say, all right, the DSLR is going to stay a DSLR, and maybe they're going to come up with a higher-end mirrorless camera, which would really compete with the Sony A7 and the uh, GH4 and that kind of environment as a quote-unquote mirrorless. And again, there's no rumor of that on Canon Rumors. I'm just throwing that in the bucket. But The problem with that is the, actually the lens offering. So if you look at the EOS... M lineup right now, they haven't really invested much in the way of good quality lenses for right. the EOS M body. So the only way to get those is to use an adapter, which basically negates the entire purpose of having a nice, <laughs> cute, skinny, tiny oh. form factor. Right. Uh, plus, the EOS M1 and 3 had awful, awful, awful AF systems. Right. Uh, maybe they've improved that in the M10. But I haven't heard anybody trumpeting the N10 as the next uh, life-changing event for Canon cameras. No, no. I'm I'm supposing that it would be a different camera that would be a new thing slotted in the mirrorless arena that would have 4K. But I, again, I don't know. I, that would I, be great if it happened. Canon has never really snuck up and surprised us in the past <laughs> with anything uh, that revolutionary. I'm looking on eBay right now just to see where the market is for a 5D Mark III, and the market is pretty depressed as far as pricing goes. I'm seeing 5D Mark III's for as low as uh, $1,600. Wow. That, yeah, that's crazy, crazy priced. Uh, looks like brand new, uh, about $2,000. Gray market, it dips down to $1,900 on occasion, $1,800. Uh, used models are selling for fifteen to sixteen hundred dollars. Those are prices that uh, really indicate a a new camera coming down the line. And if there's not one coming, I mean, what does that mean? That means people are basically chucking their Canon cameras and moving on to some other uh, body type. And they're glut in the market there. Isn't yeah, it? and I, I mean, I'm guilty of it. Like I have a Sony camera right here, and I have a GH4, and I've started using those more than I do my Canon bodies, but for stills, I still reach for my 5D Mark III always, and I still like the color science of the 5D Mark III. I would love for Canon to release something that competes evenly with these other cameras. Otherwise, they might end up losing me as a customer as well. And yeah. this is a guy that has two bags full of L-series <laughs> lenses and not not your just basic like uh, Fairweather fan of Canon gear. That's not good. That's not good at all. It's it's very scary. I, I really, when I saw that, I was like, holy crap, if that's true. And I, I, I understand that Canon wants to protect their high-end range cameras. But 
they're they're going to just shoot themselves in the foot if they don't put 4K in the next 5D. Just that's it's just dumb. <laughs> Come on, Canon, you know you can do it. We've seen it in the 1DC. Obviously, you are capable of adding that to a camera. So oh, sure. Please don't I, let it, us down, man. Yeah, it's it's a protection issue, not a can do issue. I, there's no way. But anyway, so. All right, last thing on the list here, and we'll just touch on this really quick. Uh, the A-mount series of cameras from Sony is sort of been abandoned. We haven't seen anything new for quite some time. Uh, it does look like they have a new camera out. We are looking at the A68, which is a new A-mount camera. Pricing is $760. Uh, this lineup has kind of been cannibalized by the E-mount series cameras, so it is nice to see that they haven't completely dropped support for A-mount bodies. Uh, otherwise, pretty much your typical Sony offering using the translucent layer. This is a crop sensor body, not a full-frame body, so there you have it. New release from Sony. I don't know, Mitch, you have anything to add to that? But otherwise, it's not yeah. extremely exciting. Uh, uh, yeah, no. We're going to go with that one. All right. On that note, guys, <laughs> I think we're going to wrap up the podcast. Mitch, where can people find you? I'm at a website called Planet 5D. Planet 5D. Planet 5D, if you haven't heard of me. You can also check me out at planetmitch.com where I put some of my personal projects. And for me, guys, as always, dslrfilmnoob.com. Look forward to the E1 review coming soon, as well as some stuff from Devin showing up on the site. I think he's doing some ceremonic audio recorder reviews. So keep an eye out for that. We will see you next time on another exciting episode of DSLR Film Noob Podcast. <laughs>
Um, I have to give a presentation today on some technical topics, so uh, ah. my brain is wrapped around those items instead of the items that I would normally wrap them around. That's okay. Right. We love you anyway. All right. Stop in the live broadcast now. Thanks. Bye. Oh, bye. <laughs>